we all have favorite songs that are special to us, but there's very few songs that have had such a global impact that the world has never been the same since. If there's one thing that can shift attitudes, inspire movements, and make a mark on history, it's music. So here are four songs that changed the world forever. First on our list is John Lennon's Imagine. Little did John Lennon know that actually when he sat down on that pearly white piano that day that he would be writing one of the most important songs of our time. Lyrically, the theme is one of peace and unity and this imagining of a utopian world where there are no divides because of possessions or country borders or religions. In part, the main lyric was inspired by Yoko Ono's book, Grapefruit, and on the song she said, Imagine was just what John believed, that we are all one country, one world, one people. He wanted to get that idea out. Lyrically, the repetition of Imagine throughout the song across multiple lines emphasizes the visionary aspect, and he addresses the audience through the lyrics directly, which creates an intimate conversation to be had. And even though this song is softly delivered, it still has an urgency about it. The white Steinway piano that was used to compose this song was eventually bought by George Michael for 1.45 million, which makes it one of the most expensive pieces of pop memorabilia of all time. It's since been donated to the Beatles Museum in Liverpool. As far as songs go, this one has definitely had its fair share of milestones, reaching number one across multiple countries, and I guess being sang by numerous celebrities during a global pandemic, maxing out everyone's cringe meters. But let's forget about that part. Because Imagine has carried people through some of the hardest worldwide felt moments of grief over the last 50 years. After John Lennon's death in the 80s, the song continued to be a symbol of peace and a go-to track to bring the world together at times where it really needed it. For example, the song was played at the 2005 London Olympics to honour the victims of the 7-7 bombings, and also after the Paris attacks in 2015. Its lyrics were also displayed across billboards on New Year's Eve of the millennium in New York as a message of hope for the future. Speaking of the Big Apple, Strawberry Fields Memorial in New York is a living tribute to John today that you can visit. The Imagine Mosaic is a focal point that fans gather to pay tribute daily. It's worth a look if you're ever in the area. I love this quote from him that says, now I understand what you have to do, put your political message across with a little honey. You should also check out this book by Hunter Davies. It's a collection that offers insights into John Lennon's thoughts and creative writing process. Definitely check it out. In many ways, this song feels like a view into what the world could be, but at the same time, it's a stark reminder of all the work that is yet to be done. Now it's hard to imagine a world without a song like this that has the superpower of bringing people together in the way that it does. Before we continue, if you're enjoying this video, then hit like and subscribe for me real quick. It'll take you two seconds. I like to cover all things music, tech, and creativity on this channel, so if that's your thing, have a little explore. Next on our list is Bad Reputation by Joan Jett. And this is one of my favorites, being that big middle finger to the music industry saying, fuck you, I'm doing it my way, just watch me. Bad Reputation embodies the punk ethos of defiance, and it became one of the world's greatest anthems for people who felt misunderstood. It's a feminist anthem that challenges societal norms of how women should be, and instead celebrates non-conformity and individuality. Not to mention it laid a lot of solid groundwork for future female musicians who felt the same. Joan Jett released Bad Reputation after her previous band, the Runaways disbanded, and after that time, she received a lot of significant rejection across the music industry. So what does she do? She releases Bad Reputation on her own independent label, Black Heart Records, making her one of the first women ever to own and completely control an independent record label. Badass. Lyrically, the theme is about defiance and rebellion, and Joan Jett's vocal performance throughout the track just matches it perfectly. The structure of the verses balances out the actions of others with the singer's reactions, which kind of emphasizes her indifference. And the repetition that's used throughout the lyrics kind of makes it feel like a chant that's being proudly yelled out at a protest. Joan Jett herself, and this song in particular, has left an undeniable footprint for future female generations to follow. The song played a significant role in the Riot Girl movement in the 90s, inspiring a generation of female musicians to start their own bands, like Bikini Kill, Bratmobile, Sleater Kinney, who all embraced that ethos of empowerment and DIY punk feminism that you hear in Bad Reputation. The song has been synced across numerous TV shows and films, like this cool TV show called Freaks and Geeks, 10 Things I Hate About You, and most recently, Glow, or Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling on Netflix. Joan Jett performed Bad Reputation at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony in 2015, which was such a huge symbol of triumph. There's a documentary called Bad Reputation on Amazon Prime, which you should check out. It covers Joan Jett's music career and also her influence on music and culture. 
On the track, Joan Jett said, I figured out it was a social thing, what women were allowed to do. At a very young age, I decided I was not gonna follow women's rules. This song was such a catalyst for many women to break away from the shit that society would expect from them and instead carve a path out of their own. And it significantly broke down walls within the music industry that allowed future female independent musicians in particular to spill in and make their mark too. And that makes Joan Jett and her reputation one of the world's greatest. Next, let's talk about Redemption Song by Bob Marley. This is the closing track off of the 1980 album Uprising and stands as one of the most profound anthems of emancipation and freedom in music history. It was definitely a departure from his usual reggae sound that characterizes a lot of his other work. It's actually a soft acoustic ballad, but still has a heavy and important message being one of his last ever songs. Bob Marley was taught to play guitar by a guy called Joe Higgs in Jamaica, who was also known as the godfather of reggae. So in some ways, the acoustic style of Redemption Song almost feels like a nice nod to Joe Higgs and his teachings and influence on Bob. The lyrics are inspired by a speech given by Marcus Garvey, who was a Jamaican political leader and influential figure in the Rastafarian movement. The lyrical theme revolves around freedom and oppression, and at the heart of its chorus, it says, Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our minds. He was suggesting that true freedom also comes from liberating your mind. And so the track had this capacity to speak to this universal desire of freedom. So it has many parallels with John Lennon's Imagine here, with this thought of global consciousness. The song has even made it to the moon, sent to space as part of the music selection on the Odysseus Lunalander, launched on February 15th, 2024. It kind of toppled over when it got up there, but still, what better way to say we come in peace than with Bob Marley? It's often sang and played at many protests and rallies around the world today, and is also the subject of study in educational settings as well, with its lyrics often being analysed under the context of liberation, music history, and freedom. Little fun fact that I never knew, Bob Marley's home in Kingston in Jamaica is now a museum celebrating his life and his work, which you can visit today. Amazing. Redemption Song is definitely a melting part of Bob Marley's own ideals and Redemption is definitely multifaceted here. Number one, it's about personal redemption, so that liberation of your own mind. Number two, the cultural redemption, that connection to Bob Marley's heritage. Number three, a kind of political redemption with that call to a collective movement towards justice. And number four, a kind of spiritual redemption as well, something that aligned with his own beliefs of living in harmony. You won't find any music festival anywhere in the world that doesn't have a waving flag with the global ambassador of reggae music on it. His work has been and will continue to be celebrated by generations. And as one of his very last songs, Redemption Song kind of feels like a guiding light for the world in times when we really need it. And boy, do we need it. The next song we're talking about is Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. The content of this song is disturbing, but it's a powerful condemnation of racial violence in America at the time. It was adapted from a poem written by a guy called Abel Mirapol, who was a Jewish high school teacher in the Bronx who came across this horrifying photograph of lynchings in the Deep South. Billie Holiday's adaptation of this song and her performances of it to mixed audiences at jazz clubs throughout the 1930s forced audiences to confront the brutal reality of racial violence in America at the time. It played a pivotal role of bringing those realities to the forefront of everybody's conscience. Billie Holiday first performed Strange Fruit at Cafe Society in New York in 1939. It was a venue known as the wrong place for the right people due to its progressive politics and its promotion of racial integration, which at the time was seen as radical. The song was so powerful that the owner of Cafe Society, a guy called Barney Josephson, set a unique set of rules for the song's presentation. Number one, it always had to be the last song in the set. Number two, all service in the venue would stop when the song was being performed. And number three, the whole room would plummet into darkness, apart from a spotlight on Billie Holiday's face on stage. The messaging behind Strange Fruit called for that silence and for people to shut up and listen. On some occasions, Billie Holiday wouldn't be able to get through the entire song without breaking down. And is it really any wonder? The opening line, Southern trees bear a strange fruit, immediately sets an uneasy tone. The term strange fruit is serving as a metaphor for the bodies of those lynched by mobs hanging from trees. Blood on the leaves and blood at the root. 
This line highlights that racism is not just surface level, but is rooted deeply in the nation's history and culture. The song did face censorship and was banned by a number of radio stations and venues, but this only fueled its notoriety and the public's interest in hearing it. On her first performance of Strange Fruit, Billie Holiday said, The first time I sang it, I thought it was a mistake. There wasn't even a patter of applause when I finished. Then a lone person began to clap nervously. And then suddenly everyone was clapping. The impact of the song and Billy's performance even drew the attention of the FBI and Federal Bureau of Narcotics. A guy by the name of Harry Anslinger began a campaign against Billy Holiday, in part because of her performances of Strange Fruit. This guy was known for his racist attitudes and for targeting jazz musicians in particular, and actually assigned an agent to track Billie Holiday after she refused to stop performing the song. This guy believed that jazz was musical anarchy, and Billie Holiday became one of his prime targets. He went out of his way to try and take her down. But in the face of immense pressure and threats, Billie Holiday continued to perform Strange Fruit, persisted, and in doing so, laid the groundwork for many protest song anthems that followed. While the civil rights movement gained momentum in the decades after the song's release, Strange Fruit is often cited as an early influence in bringing attention to racial violence and injustice in America. The song was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 1978, acknowledged for its cultural significance, and was named the Song of the Century by Time Magazine in 1999. Today, you can find a statue of Billie in Baltimore, and her music and influence is celebrated across various jazz museums and cultural centers. Also, check out this book by David Margulis. It specifically explores the story of the song and its significance in American music. Strange Fruit is definitely a landmark in the history of protest music. Billie Holiday's courageous performances of the song, despite her own personal risk, just goes to show how important songs can be as a form of social commentary. That unsettling imagery throughout the song forces listeners to confront the realities of racial violence even in the world today. This song is a prime example of the power that songs have to challenge people and highlight what the world needs to hear in order to change. The value of music and songs today is saturated and is always questioned, so it feels fulfilling to spotlight songs that made a mark 50 years ago and continue to do so today. It'll be interesting to see 50 years from now what songs that have been written today have that level of influence all those years later.